Right now, it says that 30% of the world population, 31% is Christian. 31% of the world population. How many are we? Eight billions? Eight billion. Eight billions. Yeah, 30% 30 of us, we are considered Christians. And there are nations right now that are considered Christians. Uganda is said to be 80% Christian. Nigeria. And I believe the U.S. Are you still Christian? You don't so sure? Okay. Yeah, I will say, uh, I had recently that in the last few years, about 30 million Americans have walked away from their faith. They no longer believe in anything. 30, 30, million, 30 million in the U.S. But 30% of the world population, that's bigger. I mean, we are in Africa right now, there's one point billion Africans. And that will be 30% of the world population will be 2 billion and 200 million people that are supposed to be Christians right now or considered to be Christian. And how many believe that in history, that's the biggest number that we ever been in all of humankind. But that has led me to a very big question that I've been asking myself. That where is, is the impact of this 30% all over the world? Why do we have and live in a time where, where there is so much crime? The rates of crime are rising in every corner of our world. And yet we still have this 30% that are supposed to be Christians. Divorce, case, divorce rates in the Christian nations are, are the same as the Muslim and everywhere. If the poverty rates are rising. They are skyrocketing. People are getting poor daily. Why? If the number of Christians are increasing, we should be asking ourselves the question, why? And we should have the answer because I believe we do have the answer. So I've been studying this word called the disciple. It's a simple word, the disciple. And I've started calling myself, I am a disciple because the word Christian does not mean anything. Jesus never called anyone a Christian. I want that to sink in. Jesus never called any one of his people a, a Christian. The word Christian is used three times in the Bible. Twice in the book of Acts. And that was, if you were called a Christian, you know you were a tellerist. That was a demeaning word for the book of Acts. And, um, and so Jesus called his people disciples. And that's a word we don't call ourselves. We don't, most people don't consider themselves to be disciples. We all call ourselves, I am a Christian. I am a Christian. And for me, and from where I come from, it may mean nothing. It means that you, in my background or my tribal thing, it means you have and you carry a European name. Robert is a Christian name. And so when I was a baby, I don't even remember how old I was. They took me to this church and they put sprinkled water on my face and they gave me a name Robert and I became a Christian. I don't have a picture of it. I don't remember accepting, asking anyone to make me a Christian. When I started speaking and understanding, I was told you are a Christian. But if I told you what I did then, you don't believe that I was a Christian. <laughs> So, uh, so who is a Christian? Let me give you a, a definition. Who is a Christian? A, a, who is a disciple? Excuse me. Who is a disciple? A disciple is a follower of a teacher with an intention of becoming like his master. A disciple, mo, mo, you, if you go to most dictionaries, they will, teach you, they will tell you that a disciple is a student. A disciple is not a student. You can be a student in a college and your, your, your lecturer is not a doctor, but you are going to school to become a, a, a doctor. And so, but when it comes to a disciple, a disciple is someone that follows a person that they, they imitate, they want to become like. That's a disciple. And so a Christian, it can be anything. And we've made it anything, everything we want to be. There are, there are many types of disciples. 
In, the, in Jesus' time, there was the Pharisees, they had disciples. John the Baptist had disciples. But today I want to talk to you about the Jesus kind. The Jesus kind of disciples. And I, I, I believe this is our highest calling as a church. This is our highest calling to be the disciples of Christ. And um, with that, I want you to open your Bibles. If you have one, you sh which you should, in the book of Matthew chapter 28 and uh, verse 19. Matthew 28, that actually the last chapter in the book of Matthew. And verse 19, this is Jesus after resurrection. He tells his disciples that all thought it has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In, in verse 19, he says, go therefore and make disciples. You see, not Christians. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the last words of Jesus. So this is, uh, and so when Jesus chose the 12, the 12, he called them to be his own and he gave them a special name, my disciples. And I want to take you through four stages of discipleship that Jesus took his disciples through and I want you to tick where you are today. And I will give you those four stages. The first one, the first stage that Jesus took his disciples through is what I call come and see. Come and see. In, in John 1 and verse 35, the Bible says, this is after Jesus has, had been this, uh, baptized by John the previous day. And Je Jesus came back the following day and he's walking around John's church. And John points out to Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And the Bible says when the disciples of John heard him say, they started following Jesus. And when Jesus saw them walking after him, this is not Facebook that they are following him. This is, real, this is a real movie. They are following Jesus in real life. And when he looked back, he saw them following and he said, whom do you seek? And they said, Rabbi, where do you stay? And he said in verse 39, come and see. Come and see. He leaped right to them. He went and said, That's the, come and, and you will see. He leaped right to them. They went and saw where he was staying. Jesus had a home. He had an address. And they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. This is the first interaction Jesus had with what he later called his disciples. They came, they stayed a few hours, and they went home. And he, uh, if you read through the Bible, you realize this stage last, lasted about, about four, five, six months. They would come from their home and stay with him for a few hours and then go home. This stage is amazing. It is it's an attractive stage. It's a stage every Christian goes through. Every church should create space for this stage. Come and see. This is a stage where you come and you don't know anyone in the church. Someone invited you, and you just came for the first time. And how, what do we do on this pulpit? If he impresses you, you get to stay. If you like us, you get to stay. If the choir sounds good, if the, I mean, people at this stage are very delicate. They're like babies. They are actually babies. I've been, I've been at this stage. But the problem is that many Christians, 80% of the Christians all over the world, not here in the U.S., back in Africa. They stay at this stage. Come and see. They come. The only commitment at this level is that you show up on Sunday. And we show up on Sunday, and we, the pastors, are so happy to see you. You can miss the next month, but when you show up, we shall, we shall be so glad to see you back. No question asked. You just show up and say, oh, my God. You, we, are so, we are so glad to see you. How happy to have you again. And, and we're supposed to kiss the babies. And we're supposed to do all these things to make you happy. So you can come again. And unfortunately, I know people that have been on this stage for more than 20 years. 
They go fishing on Sunday. They go riding on Sunday. They don't bring their family to. They stay in bed in Uganda, not here. You guys are good. <laughs> you are safe. But this is the most, <laughs> it is, it's, a, it's a stage of attraction. It's a, this is why we have these lights. Everything here is made for this stage. We need to attract people. And uh, the, attra the law of attraction says, out of 10 that you attract, maybe you can keep two. So if you are going to increase the church by 100 members, you need to have 1,000 people come through. And that's very expensive. This is where Jesus has come and see. This is where Jesus feeds the 5,000, the 4,000. And they are happy. They, go, they went after food, after dinner. And they had this big meeting. And they said, let's make him a king. And Jesus ran away. And he hid himself. They looked for him. And they found him. And they said, Master, we've been looking for you. And Jesus said, you're not looking for me. You're looking for food. And then, then he said something that uh, maybe I should not say here. <laughs> but that's, that's the first stage. Come and see. They come and some return and some don't, don't return. And so uh, stage number two is the stage that I call follow me. Follow me. In Matthew 4 and verse 18 up to 20, the Bible says as he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And the Bible says, Luke, Luke 5 gives you the detail of the story. He, he went to their workplace. Remember, come and see, they came to where he was staying. But now Jesus is going to their workplace, to where they work. And he's telling them, cast your nets into the deep. And the Bible says they cast their nets and they caught a big catch. And after they counted the fish in, in, in Matthew 5, Jesus turned to them and said, follow me. And I'll make you fishers of men. Now you cannot just come and see and go home. You become a real follower. In the, in the, Hebrew, in the Hebrew culture, this is exactly what happened. The, the disciple will look for a rabbi and ask him, can I please be your disciple? I want to talk like you. I want to be like you. I want to start behaving and doing things like you. But Jesus goes to his disciples and instead of them asking, he asked them, he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And this is where things get a little bit uh, hard. Why? Because now you have to leave some stuff. And God, Jesus has to make you. That word make you, it means it, uh, it, 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 to undo something and do it again. And that's why come and see stage is so present for many people. Because stage two, follow me, it has some pain. He has to break you down. He has to dismantle you and put you together. And that pain, most people don't want it in our generation. All over the world, every, everyone is looking for something easy. The commitment at this level is come and learn by watching how it is done. This is where you begin to look for Bible and buy one and so, stop using the church Bible over the projectors. I'm, say, I'm just saying, those things do not happen here. They happen back in Africa. <laughs> this is where you learn and you get baptized. This is where you, 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 it's, it's no longer, you, it's, you're no longer, no one reminds you to come to church. You wake up yourself and you come to church. Come and see someone has, called you, has to call you every morning. Hey, my brother, it's Sunday morning. Are you coming? Are you coming? At this stage, you are calling other people. You are, you know, I, I need to get myself to church. I'm tired, but I should go. I am tired, but I need to put my kids together and dress them and drive them to church. The, the commitment goes up a little bit. It involves pain, but you know you must go. 
You take responsibility over your faith. It's no longer other people believing for you. It is now you walking the talk. And it becomes personal. It is now your relationship it is between you and God. It doesn't care whether the choir is good that day, you must show up. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if the lights are on, you must be around. It is now about you and your faith. And you get to see the miracles of Jesus. This is where you see Jesus coming the storm. This is where the disciples turn to each other and say, oh my God, what manner of man is he? That even the storms obey him. You get to watch the miracles of God. And you get to stay because of the miracles. Follow me. Stage number three. This is a little bit good and hard. Gets harder. I want you to tick which stage are you. Are you come and see? Are you come follow me? Stage number three is what I call be with me. Be with me. In Mark chapter 3 verse 13 up to 15, the Bible says, Jesus went up the mountain and summoned those who he wanted and they came to him. Now, it's not coming to church. It is coming to him. Do you see that in your Bible? I'm telling you, when you buy a Bible, you'll be amazed at what your Bible says. <laughs> he, say, he says in verse 13, he said, they came to him, known to the pastor. I mean, as, at stage two, you can rely on the pastor. You can rely on the church. You can rely on other people. But on stage three, I can't be with me. You rely on the Lord. You get to know him. You are not coming to church. You are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a personal relationship. You get to hear his voice. This is where the sheep learn the voice of the, the shepherd. The Bible says he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, to be with him, not in ministry, not in church, but to be with him. Amen. And this is the point that the church, again, not in the U.S., but back in Africa, the church is missing this point. Because we, we, we come to church, we come to the pastors, but we forget one more step, which is to come to him. When you come to him, the Bible says, if you come to the Lord and you get to know him, you get to hear his voice. You get to see his face. And I want to tell you that you become what you see. And the Bible says, they, he called them to be with him, so to send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Now it is no longer them be, uh, believing what the pastor said. It is now their personal faith. And now they have seen how it is done. And now it's time to put into practice what they have seen Jesus do. And the Bible says he sent them two by two. And they went out for three days. And they came back excited. They told him, oh God, oh Jesus, even the demons obeyed us. They were so excited. Because God, Jesus did not go with them, but he was able to use them. And this is a stage where every Christian needs to get. I mean, I, I, I remember when I first became a pastor, my first two years in ministry, I, I never want to go back there because I, I, me and my wife, we never slept. Every night at midnight, we got a knock on the door and we get someone is sick. Someone is demon possessed. Someone has a problem. And you wake up in the middle of the night. You don't even remember your name at that time of the night. And you have to pray for someone. Until I woke up one day and I taught the church the, uh, the authority of the believer. I told them, stop bringing people at my house. If you can pray for them in the name of Jesus, be with them. And I remember I was going on a mission one morning and they called me. I was like five hours away from the church. And they called me and said, oh, they brought a, a demon-possessed person at the church. And I said, I'm not there. I taught you last week how to deal with the demonic. You point your fingers and say in the name of Jesus. 
and he did, and it worked, and I started sleeping. And so I remember that group of people going around that village looking for demon-possessed people everywhere. I'm like, this is good. But you'll be amazed how many Christians will shy away from a demon-possessed person. They will never even say the word demon. Why? They are so scared. Why? They've never, if you've been with Jesus, you fear nothing. And I'm telling you these things because you, in the near future, very soon, you are going to put your, you are going to need to grow your faith and become a disciple. It's time to stop just being a Christian and become a real disciple. Because a disciple will be like him, a disciple will do like him. In Matthew 10, verse 1, he says, he says and when he had called the 12 to him, he gave them this is a new king James. He called the 12 to himself. But you have also to remember all these stages, the numbers are reducing. Stage one, uh, come and see 5,000. The Bible says multitudes. They came in numbers. Stage number two, you have the 70, you have uh, the 500. We don't know where the uh, 120 went, but we, in, this, in this version, we are talking about the 12. The 12, why? Because the, the road gets tough as they walk with Jesus. And the commitment here is at stage number three, get involved in the ministry. You get to do the ministry. It's no longer Pastor Godon's church. This is my church. We find you on the street talking to people. This is my church. Oh, this is my church. That's my ministry. It's my vision. You no longer come here and complain why the lights are too low or the sound is too loud. You go and join the ministry. If the choir doesn't sound good for you, come and join the choir. At stage three, my friend, no complaint. This is your ministry. It belongs to you. You don't wait for anyone to tell you give. You give because you see a problem. You are no longer part of the complaining group. You are a solution giver. You are not a problem but a solution and before the pastor see the problem, you have to see it. Why? Because you are a growing disciple. The stage, the stage number four and the last one is what I call abide in me. Abide in me. This is, this is the last stage. Did you know that even in human life, biologically you go through four stages of life? Anyway, John 15, 5, the Bible says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me, I'm um, reading the New King James. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. At this stage, you are no longer a disciple, but you are a disciple maker. You make other disciples. You are the guy that wakes up and drive all over Tacoma and Federalway and Auburn and all the surrounding villages driving a van to bring people to church. You are the guy that is opening up your home now for buy small Bible study groups. You are the one that calling people, which part did you read? You are leading in prayer. You have someone you are teaching about the Lord and his ways. And let me, share, let me tell you something, my friend. You can never grow until you start to help someone else grow their faith. If you, if you want to grow your faith, pick someone and help them understand their Bible. Understand the scriptures. Understand to pray. This stage, at this stage, it is, um, you are not just a minister but you are the gospel. This is where Paul says, as my gospel is, this is where he says, for me to live, for me to die is a gain. To live is a gain. What does it say? To, to, to die is a gain. This is where Paul says, for I no longer live, but who Christ who lives in me. He says, he says a lot of other things that normal people don't say. Normal Christians don't say. 
A lot of Christians will never even put, up, put on the Jesus t-shirt. But the disciple is not scared. This is where Sadraj, Mesaj, Abednog are. They stand before that fantasy. And the king is looking at them and saying, I'm going to burn you guys. Amen. Peace in the chaos. And they say, yeah, we know how much power you hold, but the God we serve is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, this is the kind of faith that you need to develop, even if he doesn't. Did you know that these boys were Jewish people? And at the age of five, they start learning the scriptures. By this age, when Sadrach, Mesod, and his friends, and Daniel, they were all strong disciples. They knew the Shema. They knew that there is only one God. They will say, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And they recite that in the morning and in the evening and seek them and became part of them. So by the time they stood before the idol, they already have another culture in them. They could not break them. That's what it means to be a disciple waiting to die. He sort of records that all the 12, all the 12 disciples except John were killed. For their faith. They, dis, they died for what they believe. When Jesus saw them go and make disciples. He saw the record that they cast lots. And they brought out the map of the world. The known world of, of their time. And they cast lots. And whichever lot you, you took. That's where you went. They scattered all over the world. And started going places to places. Preaching the gospel. Proclaim the kingdom of God and proclaiming Jesus as Lord and Savior. When they came to Antioch, that's where they were told these are Christian because they said these people are turning the world upside down. So I want to end by asking, where are we, the thirty percent of the world population that are known turning this sea upside down? Our, 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 our states, our capital, everywhere we are, why aren't we turning our homes, our families, our, our neighborhood up, upside down? So the answer is right from where I gave you. So we need to become the disciples. You need to become the disciple. You need to pick up your socks and pull them up and say, you know what? I'm tired of just showing up on Sunday. I'm tired on calling the pastor every time I have a need. I'm going to pick up my Bible and read it myself. I'm going to get on my knees and pray for some hours. I'm going to get some commitment and get to know the Lord. He's mine and I'm his. I'm tired of waiting to sing two songs on Sunday. I'm going to put on as much songs as I need in my car, in my living room, everywhere I live. So we all stop complaining about church. We come to church to rejoice and celebrate the goodness of God. I'm praying for you, my brother and sister, in Jesus' name. May the Lord ignite a fire in each one of you that will cause you to run after him, to pursue him, to walk after him. Lord, I pray for all this, O God, that this will be a church of disciples, O God. People that have a heart like yours, oh God. A desire to seek you, not on Sunday, but on a daily basis, oh God. Every moment, every breath, every day, oh God, in the morning, oh God. They will say, as David is saying, that the deer pants for the waters. So my soul, and that will be a daily happening in every home, oh God. Lord, I pray for wisdom. I pray for grace.